So up to this point, we have talked a great deal about trig functions. In chapter 5, we're now going to talk about inverse trig functions. So before we start that discussion, we need to talk about what it means for a function to be one-to-one. -one. So we say that a function is one-to-one -one if there's exactly one domain value for each range value. So there's precisely one x for every y. So to test if a function is one-on-one, -on -one, um, we use the horizontal line test. So we use the horizontal line test. to test um, if a function f of x is 1 to 1. So how does that work? Um, so if we look uh, below, if we start with f of x equals x cubed, then we see this little horizontal line in gray that passes through the function. And what we see is that there's only a 1x for every y value. So this function is 1 to 1. Now if we look at this second function, f of x equals the absolute value of x, we have that um, if we were to make kind of a little table, what we see, if it was x, y table, we've got when x is negative 2, y is 2, and when x is positive 2, y is 2. So we've got one y value that has two x values, and so this fails our horizontal line test, and it's not one to one. And the reason that this is important, why we care about one-to-one -one functions, is because only one-to-one -one functions have inverses. So when we want to talk about the inverse of these trig functions that we've been discussing up to this point, we need to make sure first that they are one-to-one. -one. So let's continue. Now we look here at g of x equals x squared plus 1, and once again we see it fails this horizontal line test. You know, in table form, this looks like we've got y equals 2 again, but then we've got two different domain values for this range value. We've got x equals negative 1, x equals 1. So if you're looking at a table, if you see two x's with the same y, that function is not 1 to 1. Um, so what that means is that the inverse does not exist. It's not one-to-one. -one. Now let's look at this right-hand um, graph. Still g of x equals x squared plus 1, but we've restricted the domain. So we're only considering positive x values. And we see that when we strict the domain, we get a one-to-one -one function. So here, g inverse of x exists when we restrict the domain of g of x uh, from 0 to infinity. So let's continue this thought. If we look at the y equals sine of x function, we see that it fails the horizontal line test multiple times, you know, here, here. Um, and so if we were to move this line down, you know, it would fail here, here. So what the problem is, is that in general, um, y equals sine inverse of x uh, does not exist. But what you see in this bottom half of the graph is that if we restrict the domain, namely from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, then this passes the horizontal line test. There's no place where it fails. And so we can say that um, y equals sine of x is 1 to 1 on the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So when this restriction happens, um, we get that sine inverse of x exists. So uh, let's talk about a definition of that sine inverse function. So like I just stated, the inverse sine function is the inverse of the sine function when the domain is restricted to negative pi over 2 um, to pi over 2. And we denote this um, as y equals sine inverse of x. This is what you'll see. Oh, whoops. This is what you will see on your calculator. Okay, and then we also use arc sine of x. So there won't be an arc sine of x bu uh, button on your calculator, um, but they mean the same thing. So one thing to note is that when we're trying to find the sine inverse of x, um, what we're looking for, we have it sine inverse of x. 
is the number or angle y that's inside of that restricted interval. Okay, so inside of the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, um, whose sine is x? So what does that mean? It means that we, when we try to find sine inverse of x, we are looking for a number y so that when we take the sine of that angle y, we get x. So uh, let's, uh, we're going to do some examples, but let's first uh, talk about what this graph looks like. So uh, we'll start with sine of x. So we know that the sine of negative pi over 2 is going to be negative 1. Uh, we know that the sine of negative pi over 4 is going to be negative square root of 2 over 2. Sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 4 is a positive square root of 2 over 2. The sine of pi over 2 is a positive 1. So when we're trying to find um, a table of sine inverse of x, everything gets flipped. So namely, the domain um, of sine inverse of x is going to start at negative 1, based on the table that we're using here, and then we get that y then is negative pi over 2. So what this says is that we're looking for an angle y whose sine is 1. And then we kind of just reverse the table from here on out. So square root 2 over 2 here, pi over 4 here, 0, pi over 4, and then 1, pi over 2. Okay, so this is what our xy table looks like for these two functions. And let's look and see what they, how they graph. So we see here, um, we've just restricted uh, the graph of y equals sine of x, which we've gone over many times, um, on this interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And because the range is negative 1 to 1 there, then the domain of our sine inverse function is going to become negative 1 to 1. And so this is what that looks like, um, and this is what sine inverse looks like. So just wanted to give you a visual um, of how these two graphs compare. So next, let's talk about some identities. So we know um, that when we're looking for the sine inverse of x, we're looking for an angle y, so that sine of y is equal to x. So let's do the following examples. So we're doing sine of sine inverse of 1. So we need to start um, with the inside argument. So namely, we need to figure out what sine inverse of 1 is. So what we're looking for is, okay, if the sine is 1, what angle are we at? So if the sine um, of an angle uh, is 1 at pi over 2. We're looking for the angle pi over 2. That's 90 degrees. And then if we were to then compute the sine of pi over 2, which is 90 degrees, we're going to get 1. So what ended up happening is we got our x back, where x was equal to 1. So the sine of sine inverse uh, effectively undoes um, everything, and we just end up with the argument that we started with. Let's see if that happens again. This time we've got the sine inverse on the outside and the sine um, on the inside. So we've got sine inverse of sine of negative pi over 2. So that's going to be at 270 degrees um, or 3 pi over 2, if you're thinking positively in, uh, in radians. And so that's just going to be negative 1. And the sine inverse of negative 1 is the y value, so that when we take the sine of y, we get negative 1. And that's going to be, you know, 3 pi over 2 or negative pi over 2. And the reason we choose negative pi over 2 is because this is not in the... Uh, range of sine inverse of x. So remember, sine inverse goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, so we don't use 3 pi over 2. That's not in the range. So it just got undone again. So in general, we have the following identities. We have that sine of sine inverse of x is just x, and we have that the sine inverse of sine of x is just x. Okay, so a couple things to note. So two examples, um, if we were to do sine um, inverse of, you know, uh, zero. One thing I want to stress is that, and this isn't even an example, this is just an important point. 
this is not equal to 1 over the sine of 0. Okay, so in general, sine inverse of x does not equal 1 over sine of x. Okay.